Hello and welcome to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast Team Preview Edition. I'm your host, Ian Hardish, ready to talk all things Jacksonville Jaguars. I know you guys have all been waiting for this specific team ever since we started doing this team preview series. We're here. We're living now. It's a great day to be great. And by we, I mean myself and none other than PFF's finest, Dwayne The Rock McFarland, and a special guest. Oh my we got, goodness. We got Nora. She's kind of snoring back here. Like she's breathing really hard. She hasn't been doing shit. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let her we haven't gone for our run today which i told you guys yesterday she only does a block and then she's ready to come back to the kappa so i don't why are you breathing so hard i don't know if you guys can hear her, but if you start to hear her tell me i may have to move around the room she's breathing so loud right now she's got a long nose she's a bull terrier so she can't help it i love when we get any sort of nora appearances we just need her to bark you know whenever she finds the actual bright player she wants us to be going after luckily Dwayne, i'm pretty sure the uh, lawnmower man is away from my apartment today <laughs> so hopefully we don't have any extra distractions apologies to all you lovely listeners for that but yeah jacksonville jaguars as usual with our team previews we're going to go through the coaching staff changes yeah there are a few for jacksonville you know surprise spoiler also, all the offseason moves, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end breakdowns after that. So, again, thank you for tuning in, and let's get after it. Obviously, I think, you know, people have beat the dead horse enough about Urban Meyer's tenure. Not ending, you know, in exactly the best fashion in Jacksonville, but also offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator Daryl Bovell and Joe Cullen are out of the picture. Enter Doug Peterson, spent 2021 away from coaching after working as the Eagles head coach from 2016 and 2020, joined by offensive coordinator Press Taylor and defensive coordinator Mike Caldwell. Taylor worked with Peterson during his time with the Eagles as the quarterback coach and later the passing game coordinator. Spent last season as the senior offensive assistant for the Colts who were led by none other than Frank Reich who was basically the OC. He Not basically, he was the OC under Peterson. So we are looking at the Eagles from 2016 to 2020 in terms of trying to project this offense. And with this Philly South idea, Dwayne, I think we can expect an above average passing offense, although the pace might not be exactly where we want. 2016 to 2020, the Eagles ranks in pass play rate in non garbage time situations 12th, 14th, 11th, 14th, and 4th. The 2020 number, I think, a little bit induced by just how bad they were that year, constantly playing from behind. But the problem is, once you start looking at the pace, 27th, 17th, 30th, 17th, and 17th. And Frank Reich's Colts have also, you know, kind of driven that into the ground, just constantly moving at one of the league's slower paces. So tentatively expecting the Jaguars to be maybe between that 10 to 15 uh, ranking spot in terms of throwing the football, but the pass game volume as a whole might be a little bit more depressed than we would hope because of that pace. Do you have similar feelings here, Dwayne? Yeah, pretty similar. Um, you know, when you look at Doug Peterson, like he hasn't hesitated, like from a split standpoint to, to be willing, you know, to throw the ball. Like, I mean, I, I think overall, like he'd like to be like pass balance, like if we're going back to the Madden playbooks, <laughs> but like he is willing to throw the ball more, but yeah, there is a little bit of a concern, you know, um, with the pace and, and just the quality, right. The, the Jaguars have to take a step forward in order to run more plays. Like you, there's also like, you have to be efficient enough to keep getting first downs and stay on the field. I mean, overall, like teams plays are all pretty compressed. Everyone's closer than, you know, what we think there are definitely the outliers like Seattle last year, they ran, you know, two less games worth of plays than the bills, but you don't get those scenarios that often. The biggest thing with the Jags for me, you know, last year trailed 68% of the time by four or more points. That was the most in the league. That's the league average is 38%. So they were 30% above that. Um, they were with, they were within three points. So in a close script, only 22% of the time, um, the average NFL team is in it 35% of the time. So a lot of that is what pushed, you know, the Jags to need to, to pass the ball more last year. Now, again, we've got a total new coordinator, so that stuff doesn't necessarily matter, but that was just really pointing to like how bad the Jaguars were, right? They've made a lot of roster moves this offseason. I know we'll get into those, um, but I think just looking at where Vegas has them now, like they're projected to be one of the bottom five teams again. So that alone, right, is going to push them to throw the ball just because of the scripts that they'll end up being in. Just in terms of point differential last year, which I think tells a better overall story of like who the worst team really was. Yeah, still the Jaguars. Minus 204, man. The Jets were the only other team even lower than minus 172, which was the Texans in third place. So yeah, Jaguars, worst record in the league, and the point differential shows that that was pretty much correct. So speaking of all those offseason changes that you brought up, we do have a few. In the running back room, Carlos Hyde remains an unrestricted free agent. He was given the ball 84 times 
times last season, as all you James Robinson fantasy managers know, was quite the thorn in the side for at least those first eight, nine weeks until he suffered a concussion. Also, Dari Ogumba Wale has signed with the Texans in free agency. So a lot of, you know, just extra carries available in that backfield, obviously with James Robinson recovering from the Achilles and uh, with Travis Etienne coming back from the Liz Frank injury. The big moves were made at wide receiver. Christian Kirk, four years, $72 million contract that includes $37 million guaranteed, but they were not done. Zay Jones got a three-year, $24 million contract as well with $14 million guaranteed that those guys were brought in to replace and just upgrade the unit in general. But DJ Chark, who left and signed with the Lions, and Tavon Austin, who remains an unrestricted free agent. So, Dwayne, I know we all laughed a lot at the Jaguars when they made these moves and they were just throwing money around like they just didn't care. Still, though, Christian Kirk and, to a lesser extent, Zay Jones, they are good receivers that if you have them as your top three, top four in your offense, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I think it's an, and, and when you look historically, right, at Peterson's offense, like it's really kind of, it's a spread it around kind of offense. There isn't typically just like a major go to weapon. Now, that did develop a little bit later uh, with Zach Ertz, you know, towards the end of Peterson's time, you know, with the Eagles. Um, so, I mean, we could, we could see that, but I just don't see a talent on this team that screams, oh my God, like we're going to really get them the ball. So we'll talk, we'll break the receivers down more in a minute, like, and kind of look at, you know, what are the things that we typically think are leading indicators to breakouts and do the Jaguars, do they have, do any of the receivers on their team possess any of those traits? So that's something that we can walk through when we get there. But historically, like Peterson's been fine just spreading the ball around, you know, and that's something Trevor Lawrence seemed fine doing as well last year. He didn't really lock on to any one player. So I think we'll see a similar offense from that respect. But to your point, like with, I think it is an upgrade, right? Yeah, we did kind of make fun of them. There weren't any elite signings. They probably overpaid for some players, but there's no way to deny that it is an upgrade overall to the receiving core for the Jags. There are worse things in life than being overpaid you know what i'm saying so that was my main <laughs> point with kirk and zay like yeah i agree probably shouldn't have been given that much money but they were and they're, that doesn't make them bad just because they're probably making too much money similar sentiment with you know my zeke rants that i ha- feel the need to go on like every other podcast but moving on staying in the moment at tight end signed evan ingram formerly of the giants to a one-year fully guaranteed nine million dollar contract obviously didn't quite fulfill those expectations with the giants but maybe just maybe tight end whisperer doug peterson has has something up his sleeve and by tight end whisper I mean he got to play with he got to coach Travis Kelsey and Zach Ertz must be nice tight end James O'Shaughnessy is out of the picture signed with the Bears played in 57 games with the Jaguars over the last five years also Jacob Hollister out of the picture after signing with the Raiders so Dwayne we'll talk a little more about Evan Ingram versus Dan Arnold I know we already did enough <laughs> on the Houston Texans I'm, I'm not I'm not well. talking anymore about Evan Ingram I'm just gonna <laughs> let you go on a rant <laughs> sounds good to me so I won't you know burden the listeners with too much more of that right now only meaningful skill position draft picks were the fifth actually just one yeah fifth round Ole Miss running back Snoop Connor great name lone addition to the skill position court during the draft maybe Connor's best days are ahead of him but as I like to bring up in each and every one of these articles and just to remind you all the fantasy track record of players not selected inside the draft's first three rounds is not pretty not saying Snoop and some of these other guys can't work their way into a rotation but even the biggest Snoop Connor truthers out there you need to look yourself in the mirror and just realize that yeah when James Robinson pulled this off as an undrafted free agent turned in a top 24 PPR season that was cool it's also one of five instances that someone drafted outside the top three rounds pulled that off at the running back position over the past 10 years so you know let's not make a habit of chasing those exceptions to the rule like James Robinson so with all that said Dwayne Let's get into the quarterback room. Trevor Lawrence, my QB 21 at the moment. Might have actually bumped him up a spot or two as I was going through the old rankings at midnight. Maybe not the best time to do it because, you know, (laughs) I got a couple things in my system, maybe uh, tainting my view on things in there. But basically with Lawrence. You're just being open-minded. You're open-minded in that state, Ian. That's what I say. Thanks. (laughs) Make me feel better. With Lawrence last year, look, he was terrible. Pick a stat, any stat. He was 36 among 44 quarterbacks in PFF passing grade, 27th big time throw rate, 29th in turnover worthy play rate, 40th in yards per attempt, 34th in adjusted completion rate. Doesn't exactly wasn't all his fault. But with that said, I don't exactly see these like, oh, Trevor Lawrence is gonna take the Joe Burrow leap because Dwayne. Joe Burrow was a lot better than Trevor Lawrence and Zach Wilson were, even as a rookie, man. I think that's kind of the point a lot of people are missing here. I went ahead and I took the quarterback numbers for the rookies over the past two years. And just in terms of PFF passing grade, man, the order goes Herbert, 
Mac Jones and Joe Burrow. All these guys are 74 or above. Then we got Tua, Trey Lance, and Justin Fields between 60 and 63. The four guys under 60, Davis Mills, Trevor Lawrence, Jalen Hurts, and Zach Wilson. You can look at the big-time throw rates. Those favor, favor Fields a little bit. We did see Lawrence have a slightly better adjusted completion rate than some of these guys. But, man, even relative to his rookie fellow rookie quarterbacks, just wasn't a good year from Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, when we broke down the Jets, uh, Dwayne, one of the things I went through was quarterbacks that have been this bad as a rookie and still managed to come back in their second year and put forward some big fantasy numbers. And those guys, Derek Carr, Mitch Trubisky, Blake Bortles, Carson Wentz, there is a track record, but then there's also a bunch of guys like Josh Rosen, Josh Rosen, Dwayne Haskins, Geno Smith, Brandon Whedon, Case Keenum, EJ Manuel, Teddy, Tua, Sam Darnold, Ryan Tannehill, all average fewer than 15 fantasy points again in their second season under center. So the million dollar question, Dwayne, or you know, if you're playing in the puppy, $75,000 question, whatever. Do we think Trevor Lawrence has enough upside to go from truly being one of the worst quarterbacks in the NFL to someone worth chasing in fantasy land? Because right now, I would just settle for an improvement. It seems like to me we're looking at an awfully big gap for him to be someone that we're going to be kicking ourselves for not drafting here in six months. Yeah, I think the key for Lawrence, I mean, he did get an upgrade right in the weapons, and you know, we've discussed that. So that should help him. You know, he he still was a young quarterback, still is a young quarterback. So, I mean, some, look, we've kind of gotten spoiled, you know, uh, with how good some of these quarterbacks come out and play, you know, in their first season. And then so anytime somebody has a season like what we saw with Lawrence, you know, it, it definitely raises red flags for us, right? But again, we've been kind of spoiled by some of um, the early quarterback play that we've seen here in recent years. So I don't want to get too low on him, but I think one way Lawrence could easily, you know, re- like, you know, make things a lot better. Um, and this comes back to the coaching staff as well, but like, let's use him a little bit more, right? On the in, on the ground, yeah. you know, I mean, last year's design rushing attempts, he accounted for 11% for the Jaguars. Which is, you know, it's it's above average versus, you know, an NFL quarterback. But, like, I think he could easily be, you know, a 15% guy. He could also scramble a little bit more. He only scrambled on 5% of his dropbacks last year. Like, he could easily be, like, at a 7 8%, you know, on that. And so I think that's one way that Lawrence, you know, who we saw really do a nice job of that at Clemson. Not saying he's not, you know, he's not a... He's not a Lamar Jackson, right? He's not a, a Jalen Hurts. We're not saying he's that. But he's he can be, you know... Jones. Right. Yeah. He's not even quite where Daniel Jones is, but like, I think he could get to like a Daniel Jones level, right? I think he could play in that range. And if he did, and then he took a small step forward in passing as well, then that kind of, I think he has more outs than some of the other quarterbacks just because of his legs. Um, but again, we, we would need to see a jump in that area. Um, I am excited that we do have a new coordinator. Obviously last year he was, he was saddled, you know, with a terrible situation from a coaching aspect. So I think there are a lot of positives. Um, but to your point, when you look at that list, like it wasn't just that he didn't perform well, it's, you know, he performed towards the bottom, right. Of that list. And I got got a hellacious list real quick. There are some busts. <laughs> quarterbacks to average six or fewer yards per attempt, even after taking out RPOs, screens, and play action attempts. So we're trying to get stable stuff here. It was Tua, Heineke, Huntley, Brissett, Mike Glennon, and Trevor Lawrence. Like that's what we're looking at last year. It really was terrible. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, and I looked at some. I didn't look at that exact one, but I did look at some similar data points that definitely gave me pause. But where you're getting him right now for ADP, he's going as a low end uh, QB two. Um, so it's fine. Like if you're wanting to take him in that range, I don't really have an issue with taking him. I can't, what do you, where did you say that you have him ranked right now? I have him 21. Okay. So we're really close. Like I've got, I've got, I've got him right now at 19, you know, so his FFPC ADP is 22 underdog. Uh, he's going off the board. Well, this, uh, QB 16, is that still right? No, that might not be right. I think he's lower than that now, but I think he's more like QB 20. I would have to go back and look. Um, actually, hang on. I have it right here. Looking at him over on underdog. He is actually at QB. No. Yeah. So he's 19. Sorry. Sorry, 197 on FFPC. That's his total ADP, though, right? And 145 on underdog. Um, but part of that is that's best ball, right? Best ball, people take more quarterbacks early, um, and everybody takes at least everybody takes at least two. Some teams take three, so that's really what's pushing him up. It's not so much a difference, right? In his actual QB rank, they're pretty close on both sides. 
I don't think that anyone in one quarterback league is going to be need, need, need to worry about Trevor Lawrence. Mm-hmm. If he comes out of yep. the gate hot and he has some good matchups, like absolutely waiver stream wire. him. But yeah, he's going to be a waiver wire guy. The way my rankings are kind of looking, we have that tier of like Rogers, Stafford, Cousins, and Carr that are you know kind of around that QB one borderline. After that, I have Watson there for right now. Him, Fields, Winston, and Tannehill in like a mini kind of funky tier. And then it gets interesting because we have these low end QB twos where we can talk ourselves into Lawrence, but we need to check a lot of boxes in order to do that. And that's kind of the same way with these guys. So I have Zach Wilson, Trevor Lawrence, Tua, Daniel Jones, and then probably Mac Jones in that. Where do we fall there? And I, maybe the right answer, Dwayne, I think we've kind of had this approach to a couple of these guys. Like I'm not vehemently trying to say we need to draft Lawrence above Tua. I think this is the spot in the draft where you're probably trying to get your second quarterback and just try to play the stacking game at that point. If you already have Kirk, then yeah, you probably should be going after Lawrence. But if you have uh, uh, Elijah Moore or Garrett Wilson already, it probably makes more sense to go with Wilson. If you have Tyreek and Waddle, go, go with Tua. Is that how you feel? Because again, well, I have it ranked right now, Wilson, Lawrence, Tua, Daniel Jones, and Mac Jones, but I'm not afraid to even bump Mac to the top of that if I happen to have some Patriots wide receivers. Yep, that's exactly how I'm approaching it. And then that also helps you basically just spread it out across those guys, right? Because, yeah. I mean, obviously we don't feel that great about any of them. <laughs> so I would rather let, you know, something like that kind of dictate the way my exposure is going to work. I don't want to be overweight on any one of them versus one another. Like, I think we could make an argument for each one, but I don't think it would be a really strong argument that was super, you know, backed by a lot of data where you and I could just be like, absolutely, you have to, it has to be Zach Wilson. Like for Zach Wilson, their argument would be, um, I like his weapons better than Trevor Lawrence's, yep. right? Because I think the high upside of, of a Garrett Wilson, Elijah Moore, who we saw flash in a big way, and you still have Corey Davis, I think that receiver trio is better than what Trevor Lawrence has. They're, they both had similarly bad rookie seasons. I think if you want to talk about Mac Jones, he was actually a better quarterback than Trevor Lawrence you know, in his first season. But their weapons are similar. You might even give Trevor Lawrence the edge. I think they're pro- it's probably a coin flip, right? Mac Jones versus Trevor Lawrence. But we know that the Patriots could be very willing to continue, right, to try to play defense and not really let Mac you know, throw the ball that much yet. We're going to have Bill Belichick, a former defensive coordinator, running the show. Whereas with Lawrence, we could see more of a pass-happy attack. So I think there's a lot of different ways we could argue it. Tua, obviously the weapons, man. Like when you have Tyreek Hill and you have Waddle, but he's going into year three. Trevor Lawrence has less, he has more of an unknown upside in year two. See, like we could go back and forth because I do it. Like when I'm ranking them, I'm sitting here driving myself mad going back and forth with these things, you know. So I think we could tell ourselves a story for any of them. But at the end of the day, and unless you have a specific take here, I don't think there's one thing that I would just hang my hat on where I'm like, no, it has to be Tua every time I'm in this tier. Or no, it has to be Trevor Lawrence every time I'm in this tier. I much prefer letting, you know, the, the skill players I took earlier, like you talked about, help me make the decision. Yeah, I think you put it nicely during our best ball stream uh, we recorded yesterday. It should be live for all you lovely viewers on Friday, where it's like when you have this quarterback ranked outside the top 20 or you have a running back outside the top 50, wide receiver outside the top 60, like you probably shouldn't be all that confident in them. Otherwise, why the hell do you have them ranked that low in the first place? Like if you really think Trevor Lawrence is going to take this next step and be the next Joe Burrow, what are you doing ranking him as a QB 21? Like he should be inside your top 12. At that point, I understand. Understand, you know, playing the ADP game wouldn't make that uh, wouldn't make much sense there. But yeah, when we're talking about guys that are pretty much consensusly this low in the ranks, it's hard to be too overly confident in any one scenario. So don't be. Again, you don't need to draft him in one quarterback leagues. Play the stacking game in best ball tournaments. Always advised anyway. Moving right along to the running back room, unless you want to talk about some CJ Bethard. Dwayne, we got <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, As uh, my buddy Brian Drake calls him, beat hard. Oh, Last man. name's Beat Hart. Oh, Drake. Okay, running backs. <laughs> Travis Etienne, James Robinson, Snoop Connor, and Ryquel Armstead making up their room. Again, that's it. Etienne, Robinson, Connor, and Armstead. Pretty freaking soft. Let's update the injuries here because these are the most important parts. Travis Etienne suffered that list Frank injury in August 2020. Head coach Doug Peterson has confirmed, though, and this was in May, that Etienne will be a full go for ETAs. Etienne himself said it would have been possible for him to suit up at the end of 2021. But hey, rare round of applause, Jaguars. You didn't throw your first round running back out there, you know, 
three months off a list Frank injury for a meaningless season. So ETN, we even got the report today after I wrote my article about how, yeah, like he's it's like, like he didn't even lose a step. Everything's back to normal for ETN, even though we never saw what normal was in the first place. Just another great example of the June offseason NFL news cycle. With James Robinson, tore his Achilles in late December during a Jaguars Week 16 matchup against the Jets. We know we have Marlon Mack and Cam Akers have pretty speedy recoveries, but man, there's a lot of question marks here, and I've gone ahead and I basically asked, I've gotten some good communication with Dr. Jesse Morse on uh, Twitter, and basically he would not count on James Robinson even playing football in 2022. From his point of view, the best case scenario is a 9-12 to 12 month recovery, and he was talking about how we don't even know who did the surgery. Cam Akers had a different Achilles surgeon than most running backs are used to having, so just so much uncertainty here, and even listening to Peterson, man, this was Peterson talking about both running backs. Travis is doing extremely well. He's been in our off-season program and working every day and feeling good. Again, it's a process, and we're going to continue to monitor that and keep it slow. James is progressing well. He's obviously not doing the things physically now on the football field, but we're hoping at some point during training camp that that becomes more of a reality for us, and he's doing extremely well. Which freaking running back do you think is going to be out there, Dwayne? It's going to be Travis Etienne with a fifth-round running back in Snoop and a career backup in Raquel Armstead. No slight on Armstead. I know we had to deal with that horrible COVID episode that robbed him of pretty much the entire 2020. It's awesome he still has a roster spot here. But ETN was their first-round running back. And even if Urban Meyer was the man that made that pick, Trent Baalke, their GM, who is still the man in charge, had to at least you know pretend to okay it. So... ETN, Dwayne, like I've moved him up, I think, more than almost any players since I've been going through these team previews and like trying to just adjust the adjust the ranks and be smarter about it. Right now, I have him up at RB16 behind Javante Williams, Alvin Kamara, Nick Chubb, ahead of Brees Hall, Ezekiel Elliott, and Dave Montgomery. What say you? Yeah, I've had him at 19, so it's like about time you catch up, you know, and have him in the right spot. But I have 16. No, I, Let's go. higher. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're Let's higher now. Uh, but no, I love him. Like I, I want to take him, you know? So the, I mean, I think once you factor in like the ADP and where you can get him, like I love getting Brees Hall and Travis Etienne. Like if I can make that happen on my team, like I'm all about it. So look, he, he can catch passes and he's an explosive playmaker. I know there are a lot of knocks on him as a runner. Um, there were a lot of people that, you know, that I respect in the film community that just talked about a lot of holes in his game. But at the end of the day, like, look, if you're explosive and you can catch passes, like, I just, I, I don't mean this to sound bad, but I care about that more than film, right? So we saw that play out with DeAndre Swift last last year. We had a terrible PFF rookie, or we had a terrible PFF rushing grade. Um, but what, what happened? He still broke the long runs, right? He was still involved in the receiving game. So Travis Etienne, like he profiles to be uh, what we got last year with DeAndre Swift and you're getting him, you know, in the fourth round of a fantasy draft. Sometimes he goes later than that. Like right now he's going off the board as the 19th back on FFPC. He's going off the board as the 21st back on underdog. I like him ahead of both of those. I want to stay ahead of ADP on ETN throughout the summer if I can. Like the price could eventually get too hot because I think he's going to rise. But I think he'll stay. I think Brees Hall, like putting him right in that range with Hall, like that's probably about where his ceiling is going to go as far as ADP, unless like just something super crazy happens in the preseason, you know, and he has two long 50-yard receptions. Like he's already getting, we're already seeing plenty of posts about, you know, Trevor Lawrence throwing lasers to Travis Etienne, right? <laughs> you know, who's standing like six yards away from him. Um, but it's just those two things, man. Explosive playmaking and you have that receiving upside. Like that is the absolute profile we're looking for, especially in the range of the draft where ETN's going. Like I will have heavy exposure. And that's why I'm ranking him ahead of those guys I mentioned. Like, look, James Robinson might not play football. I don't know how many more times I'm going to say this on this podcast. Probably a few. If that's our competition, a guy coming off an Achilles injury, like let's say he does make it back, man. We saw how Akers and Marlon Mack looked, and I think there is some medical evidence, not any that I can cite at this specific instance, of guys not being as efficient coming back off the Achilles injury, particularly at running back. It's going to be a small sample size, but man, even though it's small, it still can be relevant when we're talking about a guy with the exact same injury. So when I look at ETN's primary competition being a guy who either isn't going to play or will likely be extremely limited, it's like, yeah, I'm going to take him over a Brees Hall dealing with a Michael Carter in an offense that has historically leaned towards committees over an Ezekiel Elliott on the wrong side of the 1500 carry mark with Tony Pollard breathing down his neck. 
David Montgomery in another bad offense in a new scheme of Khalil Herbert down his neck. We all know what's going to happen with Cam Akers. And after that, man, we just get to a bunch of, you know, kind of more one-dimensional running backs that are in far more clear-cut committees. So I'm fine going with Javante over ETN because we, we already know Javante is just such a stud. And, you know, even if it's 250 touches versus 280, like I'm fine, uh, I'm fine betting a little bit more on the better player there. But with ETN, man, just so much upside. Like he is one of a handful of running backs that could feasibly catch like 70 passes this year and it wouldn't be that surprising yeah no i'm look i don't i love him so i mean i think the right tier is having him and Brees hall right together like the, the only thing with etn like is he is still coming off of an injury you know we've seen the recent data saying that those guys typically do not perform as well in year one even though they're back right but he's a young player and the injury did happen really early last off, you know, last year in the preseason. So I think there's a lot of positives there for ETN working in his favor. But again, like the receptions are huge. Um, so yeah, I, I love him above Montgomery. I have, I like him above acres. I like him above Elliot, you know, all those, all those guys you just mentioned, I'm fine with him. I would definitely take him over JK Dobbins. Um, but like he and Hall are like two of my primary targets. Uh, you know, if I'm going to take a running back outside of the first two rounds, um, round three is James Conner, right? And then the end of round three, early round four, it's all about Brees Hall and Travis Etienne. Otherwise, I'm pretty much not touching any of the guys going in that range. And Etienne is like potentially legit, legit as a receiver. We're not talking about someone that can just catch a swing pass here. Like here's our basically PFF 2021 NFL draft guide summary on Travis Etienne from the always great Mike Renner. While it's a tad concerning that ETN's efficiency took a massive hit, Clemson's offensive line faltered this season after losing four stars to the NFL. What ETN did as a receiver likely turned some heads. He was a downfield passing weapon in the Clemson attack after being an afterthought in that regard early in his career. His 588 receiving yards were the most of any back in the country this year. His explosiveness and tackle breaking ability didn't go away. Rather, ETN only saw 1.8 yards before contact this season compared to 2.8 in 2019 and 3.8 in 2018. Dwayne, as a Ohio State fan like we got the nice win over Clemson and ETN's uh, final game and all that but my god that previous year when he was just running over the entire state of Ohio I'm not sure like I've seen another running back in the last 10 years like put that much fear into me as a fan in terms of like if this dude just gets the ball anywhere he can t go from zero to 90 miles per hour in a second and just run away from your entire defense and it was good to see that some of the fall off in 2020 was more so due to the offensive line than a knock on him and hey we recruit we increased the receiving ability anyway. So we're both really high on Travis Etienne. That's great. Do we want anything to do with James Robinson? Because his ADP keeps going lower and lower. I mean, my God, when we were doing pre-draft stuff, he was going like the RB30 range. Now he's now you can kind of get him outside the top 50 or so backs. I still lean towards guys with lower ADP like Gus Edwards, Khalil Herbert, and Jamal Williams. I guess at what point are you willing to gamble on James Robinson? Because if he does... If he proves me wrong and the doctor's wrong and he's out there for week one, it could be a fairly evenly split two-back system. I mean, James Robinson was awesome. He was awesome last year as a rusher and receiver. I'm just not sure he's going to be out there. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's not a priority. I don't mind getting some exposure to James Robinson. I think his ADP you know, is fair for what we know now. I think you could see it either go up or down, though, right? I don't think Robinson's a guy where we clearly say, oh, man, by the time we're drafting, his ADP is going to be higher or it's going to be lower. Like, it could really go either way. So I'm not really in a rush um, because here's the thing. Even if James Robinson surprises us, to your point, and comes back, and yes, he has been good, um, like, do we see him having a passing down role? I don't think so. Um, do we see him getting more than maybe 50% of the rushing attempts? I don't think so. Um, so I just don't, I don't know the point of rostering, you know, James Robinson or, or going out of my way to roster James Robinson. Whenever we're talking about an offense that we don't think is going to be that good, um, at a, at, at a minute, you know, at a max, I think he's trying to see if he can carve out an early down role. That that's where I see him and, and he's coming off the Achilles. So even if he's back and he's ready, you know, like how good is he going to be? Yeah, we saw Cam Akers come back and like it was mind blowing how quickly he was here. But Cam Akers wasn't the same running back when we when we got him back. Now, I think that's fair, like how quickly Akers came back. Like, I think we'll see Akers, you know, be even better this season. But to your point, like this, this injury happened late uh, last December. And so I think even if he's ready, it's just there's too many question marks. And with the way the offense looks and the lack of a passing down role, I just I don't know why. Again, back to our question, like, am I going to regret not taking James Robinson? 
I, I don't think I'm going to regret it. Like, it, like it would take so many things happening. Like, ETM would need to get hurt again, right? And he would make, need to make a 100% recovery, um, you know, for me to really feel like I was going to need to regret that. I think if both these backs were 100% healthy by week one, it'd probably resemble what we see in Detroit with, uh, as my lights go out, ooh, getting spooky, uh, with Jamal Williams and DeAndre Swift. So, like, why not just take the healthy guy, Jamal Williams, right now, instead of worrying about the potential Jamal Williams that has an Achilles to worry about. So And J.J. Say- uh, Zacharyson did a pretty cool thing on this. Like, if you guys want to listen last week, he did a pod uh, just talking about, like, ambiguous backfields. Um, and it's something that we've talked about a long time, right? You know, when you're, when you have these backfields where you don't know for sure what's going to happen, like you can, you can go, you know, with the guy we think is leading in ADP, but the other thing that can happen, um, can be whenever you have two guys going like between rounds, like four and, and round 10. Now that's not where James Robinson is anymore, but if we were to get a lot of positive reports that he's healthy, believe me, there are enough James Robinson homers out there and, and for good reason. Like he, he was to your point, he's been a really good player. So I don't want to dismiss him. Like James Robinson has been an awesome awesome running back for being somebody it, you even throw out undrafted like he's been a good player right so I'm not yeah. going to discount him but at the end of the day like even in that scenario where you're getting you know ETN you know in round four and say if it was Robinson in round 10 like historically like the hit rate we're pretty good on ADP and that was basically the the gist of like what JJ had found in this in this study which made sense based on some data I've looked at in the past I didn't look at it through the exact same lens that JJ did but I think ETN, like, there's there's nothing that's going to cool me off on him. Like, you could all of a sudden, like, in two months from now, we could get a report that James Robinson's back to practice, and I won't care. I'm still going to like Travis ETN. We might bump him down a spot or two. But again, like, you're just buying into the profile in these middle rounds when you can get a an explosive pass catching back like if you can get that that's what Brees hall is that's what travis etn is right that's you know that's what we used to think antonio gibson was ah, right now he had an un, he had an unfortunate blocker in his way with jd mckissick but that's why we buy into those profiles so it's it, there's not going to be really anything that changes my mind on it to be honest unless he gets hurt need to get that gross Gibson reality check out of my mouth. So let's do some ads. Want to note that this podcast is sponsored by FanDraft. Are you holding an in-person fantasy football draft party this year? Then you need to check out FanDraft.com. It's a modern digitalized version of those old sticker boards we used to use at our drafts. However, unlike those outdated sticker boards, FanDraft makes your fantasy draft feel like the actual NFL draft with features such as custom logos, draft clock, team walk-up songs, a streaming news ticker, and much more. FanDraft works by running your league draft from the FanDraft.com website and then exporting your display onto a screen TV for the league to enjoy. This is the best part in my opinion. It can also be used fully online and any number of your league owners can join the draft remotely. So in my experience with the big sticker boards, it's fun and I continue to do it in one of my leagues in particular, but when you have a member of your league that's not able to make it for whatever reason, you know, they have a kid that they need to worry about or, you know, their family is sick or some just loser excuse for not being able to make their fantasy draft and they need to go remote. Like your solution is basically like calling them or FaceTiming them. And then you got to read to them what the picks were, who's available and all this, having the chance to still have that sticker board on a big screen and then have them not stunting your style, not getting in the way of your pool party and still being able to draft. And it makes your experience better and it makes their experience better. So, Get into the modern, the 2022 fantasy draft board system. Sign up for a free trial account at fandraft.com. And when you're ready to order the pro account, make sure to use promo code PFF to save 15% off your purchase. That's fandraft.com with code PFF. I'm Dwayne, Dwayne, just a wild ad read for him to put all that stuff in there. I definitely didn't, uh, you know, put any of that in myself. Also want to note the best place to play fantasy football this summer is underdog fantasy. As Dwayne and I have been doing multiple times now throughout this off season, trying to take down that best ball mania tournament with $10 million in total prize money. Also now I got the puppy in there with a first place prize of 75 K only got to answer $5 for that puppy. So go ahead, go over to the underdog. They're going to double your first deposit up to $100 when you sign up with the pro promo code PFF. And also if you play just 10 of those dollars using promo code PFF, you get a free PFF subscription. So what are you waiting for? Head over to underdogfantasy.com or the app store, play $10 with code PFF and draft your best ball mania team today. Dwayne, I'm not a big like play games on my phone guy. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just kind of cut it out of my system maybe 10 years or so ago, but Man, with underdog, like I, I've had a few road trips over these past few weekends. If I'm not driving, man, I'm just doing best ball drafts. I, I'm addicted <laughs> to it now at that point. Like there's no better way to get over a car ride than to play some underdog. Oh, yeah, man. Like when we travel, like I, I do a lot of best ball drafts. <laughs> um, so I've got a trip coming up in two weeks uh, where we're going down to Destin and I will be 
any moment like that Amanda's driving because like we'll I'll drive most of it but like she'll you know it's like 12 13 hours and we because we take all of our stuff that, and you know our stuff includes our kids um <laughs> so we we like we got our setup you know where we get down there and we've got all of our junk that we like to take with us so it's about 13 hour drive so usually she'll hit about four hours five hours of it and so in that time Oh yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm nailing it on underdog. There was one year though where I couldn't because you couldn't do it. in I think it was Louisiana. No. Like, so it was weird, but now it's all fixed. Like the whole drive there. I'm good. I think my personal breaking point for driving is about seven hours. Anything past that, I just become a disaster to be in the same car with. And I'll get pissed off at something that probably doesn't deserve to be getting pissed off at. So luckily my lovely fiance, Julia can hop in now and, you know, cut those drives down, get me out of that driver's seat after seven hours and get me over to underdog fantasy. Where again, promo code PFF, hundred dollar deposit match and $10 for that free. sub. let's talk some wide receivers. Obviously, a lot of big money given here, specifically to Christian Kirk. And, you know, I wrote this article before free agency, but I'm just going to bring up kind of the main point where grass is seldom greener on the other side for players that switch teams in free agency at every position, including wide receiver. Now, obviously, there's, you know, a million wide receivers that have been changing teams over the years for different size roles. So here is a list of the wide receivers that changed teams and were giving a contract worth at least $30 million. Now, remember, Kirk's is double well over double that so he's on the higher sides of things but you guys aren't going to hear too many hits marvin jones with the lions muhammad sanu with the falcons pierre garçon with the 49ers robert woods with the rams vincent jackson with the or, yeah i think vincent jackson with the bucks kenny Britt with the browns sammy Watkins with the chiefs alan robinson with the bears paul richardson with the washington at that time redskins tyrell williams uh, with the Raiders, Golden Tate with the Giants, Adam Humphreys with the Titans, Kenny Galladay with the Giants, Corey Davis with the Jets, and Curtis Samuel with the Commanders. There are some hits on there. I'm not trying to say we need to be completely out on Christian Kirk. Just realize probably a few more misses, and I think we're better off in general on these free agents to be lower than we are higher. But again, it's not about the player. It's about the ADP. And Dwayne, Christian Kirk is still pretty damn affordable. If we want to go ahead and look over at Underdog, like my big conclusion after writing up my story on was like, I can't rank him as a top 36 receiver, but that's okay. He's not going as a top 36 receiver. He's actually going as the wide receiver 42 right now, pick 89 over at Underdog Fantasy. So when you're taking Christian Kirk, I mean, the running backs available around that range, Miles Sanders, Kenneth Walker, Cordero Patterson, I, I like those running backs in that range, but if you already got some earlier, I think Kirk is a perfectly viable target. What are your overall thoughts on Christian Kirk, Dwayne? Because for me, he's not someone I think I need to go out of my way for, but where he's going right now, I think is a pretty good spot. Yeah, I'm not going out of my way for Kirk. I mean, it took four years before he got a wide receiver three, you know, performance out there, which was last year. Um, and if you look at his underlying metrics, you know, I did a, uh, an article last week on, you know, actually finding uh, breakout wide receivers based on their previous fantasy performances, but also looking at PFF receiving grade as well as yards per route run and targets per route run. And the problem for Kirk, um, what he doesn't do is he doesn't pop in any of those underlying metrics really before last year. A lot of the guys that really break out like in year five, year six, they really they have maybe a wide receiver three finish on their pro on their resume already, but somewhere along the way, like they've already had a wide receiver two targets per route run, right. Or a wide receiver two yards per route run or a wide receiver two, you know, PFF receiving grade for Kirk. He truly is just now hitting that wide receiver three threshold last season. And it wasn't really because he didn't get enough routes. Like he was out there for 61% of the routes as a rookie, 79% in year two, 78% in year three. So yeah, while there is a chance that Christian Kirk ends up being a breakout, like I don't think he's someone, one that's going to make me regret, you know, not having him on my roster. I do think he could end up as a wide receiver too, but whereas ADP is, I'm fine. Like you said, I'm just not prioritizing him because there are other receivers from other teams that just check far more boxes as far as a potential big breakout season. You know, Kirk does check a few boxes. He just doesn't check as many as some of the other players. I will say as I got into Kirk, I went, I went back and watched all of his explosive plays from last season few instances of him having man-on-man -man coverage, beating the guy, nice route, and he makes a big play with it. 
So many times, though, Dwayne, just credit to Cliff Kingsbury because they had usually Kirk in the slot running a deep cross, and somehow, some way, there's a linebacker or safety on him. And so it got me thinking, like, just how good or how often was Kirk getting matched up against linebackers and safeties, and was it an inordinate amount? And it kind of was, man. There were actually only 14 receivers last year, minimum 50 targets, that had at least 45% of their targets come against a non cornerback as the primary covers defender. The top guys were. Judy, Berrios, Rondale Moore, Monra, St. Brown, you know, Byron Pringle, T- Boyd, Beasley, Robert Woods, Kadarius Tony, Russell Gage, uh, Zacchaeus, Debo, Christian Kirk, and then Cooper Cup. So a lot of slot guys. I understand that. But man, we're having to make a bit of a jump here going into a new offense where Kirk isn't really guaranteed to be the slot receiver. I think that's the best position for him. I'm not saying he's incapable of winning on the outside, but if you look at his yards per route run, overall, he was 26th among 89 qualified wide receivers. That's good. Against non-corners, he ranked 16th. Against cornerbacks, he ranked 49th. Like, man, for Hopkins to go down like he did last year and for Kirk really not to do all that much with it, it was a good year, Dwayne, but I feel like we're looking at Kirk. He's going to an objectively worse offense with a worse quarterback. He's a good receiver. I... I just don't, like, he needs to get better, and the surrounding cast sure isn't going to help him do that. So I'm just, like, to your question, we like to ask about these guys. Are we going to be kicking ourselves for not drafting Christian Kirk? Because right now, man, after having watched a bunch of Kirk and a bunch of Russell Gage, I think Russell Gage is better at football, and I sure as hell know he's in a better offense. I don't think the targets are that different. What are you doing with those two? Yeah, I agree. I think Russell Gage is a better player than Christian Kirk. Um, you know, I just, I, I think he's more versatile. I think he can beat man coverage. I think he can play outside. Um, a lot of things that we've seen Kirk not necessarily do like on a consistent basis. Um, you know, and again, this isn't like just to be a huge knock, you know, against her, against Kirk, like he, he was fine. You know, his targets per route run last year versus man, 19%, you know, just below the league average, 20% versus zone, just above the league average. So, I mean, he, he was okay. But he just wasn't like he just didn't stand out like when he wasn't in the slot. And he's definitely not as good once you push him outside. He needs to play inside. And so I really do want to know, like, is it going to be Marvin Jones and Zay Jones on the outside with Kirk, um, you know, playing from the slot with LaVisca Chenault now returning punts? Like, that's good news for Kirk, because if it turns into any sort of rotation on the inside from the slot, that can actually hurt Kirk's value because he is at his best when he gets to play from the slot. I will say that, you know, Trevor Lawrence has got a good arm, so maybe he continues the streak, right, of catching, you know, hitting these big crossers, these, um, you know, skinny posts, all those sort of things from that slot route where you get these matchups to what you mentioned against the safeties and linebackers. I think they could potentially be there. But to your point, at the end of the day, like I consider Lawrence a downgrade from Kyler Murray. I consider the offense to be a downgrade. And so it's just like, I, I don't see a way where I just feel like, oh my God, I'm absolutely gonna gonna regret Kirk. Like I said, he does check enough boxes that I want to have exposure. I'm just not going out of my way to get it. Consensus rank right now between myself, Dwayne, and Nathan Yonke, which you all can find on pff.com under our rankings tab. He is going as our wide receiver 49, quite a bit lower than his ADP. Dwayne, I have him wide receiver 38 right now, but that seems high to me. Like, where do you kind of put him? Would you put him behind the tier of like your Garrett Wilson's Alave, Sky Moore, and Jameson Williams of the world? Because the more I think about it, maybe he should be more in that lower end wide receiver four spot as opposed to the higher end. I just don't think he has the same like best case scenario as those other guys. Yeah, I've got him in tier 4B. So I've got him at uh, ranked 48 overall. He's going down right now. Moving him down. <laughs> Yeah, I, hey, I was just I I'm, I moved up uh, ETN two spots earlier in our conversation, so <laughs> there we go. Um, no, we're good. Um, but yeah, I have Garrett Wilson, Sky Moore, Chris Olave, Hunter Renfro, Brandon Ayuk, Kadarius Tony, Chase Claypool, and Christian Watson, um, all in the tier just above Christian Kirk. I've got Kirk with Michael Gallup. I've got Kirk with Tyler Boyd. And look, these are all fine players. I just you know I'm I'm just not quite as excited you know about Kirk. He could easily outscore. A lot of the receivers I just named to you, um, but like when I look at Hunter Renfro, I look at Tony, I look at Claypool, they've just checked far more boxes of future breakout receivers than what Christian Kirk has done. As for the rest of the group, I don't think we need to spend that much time. Marvin Jones just had really the best case scenario happen last season. He had 120 targets. He didn't get hurt. He finished as the PPR wide receiver 44 on a per game basis. LaVisca Chenault, who we 
trash not not trash but like kind of i kept making the joke like all right just need a couple more guys to get hurt and then <laughs> lavisca is really going to feature it's Dwayne, a good joke you should keep it going <laughs> but lavisca had 111 combined targets and carries last year like the workload was pretty much there he did absolutely nothing with it i i continue to hold out hope but man i'm not gonna be throwing darts at him and then for zay jones i mean the man has reached 70 or more receiving yards and three three of 81 career games including the playoffs like okay if Henry Ruggs didn't have that hellacious accident happen, does Zay Jones even get like $5 million in free agency? Like he was not a starting receiver for the last two seasons with the Raiders until Henry Ruggs was out of the picture. He comes to the offense and was okay. But man, like that Zay Jones signing is right up there with uh, Cedric Wilson. We're like, I'm not trying to trash the player, but that's a lot of dollars for someone that's never done it. Do you have any interest in darts on Marvin, Zay Jones, or LaVisca Chenault? I guess maybe if you already drafted Trevor Lawrence and Christian Kirk and you want to finish off the stack. But other than that, man, I don't see any need. Yeah, not really. I mean, Marvin Jones will be 32 and a half years old when the season starts. His yards per route run have been in decline. His targets per route run, he's never is his best season ever is a 20 percenter. Like, but he's historically been a 17 to 18 percent guy. So I don't I don't see him all of a sudden getting more than that now. And now his his yak is deteriorating last year, a career low. Well, besides his rookie season, one point eight yards after the catch per reception. Um, so I mean, he's just not adding a lot, you know, once he gets the ball in his hands. And again, not a high target per route, you know, run players. So just not much to like on an aging guy there. Then whenever you look over at, you know, a player like Zay Jones, I mean, he's going into his sixth season which is really his last chance to break out, but he's flashed absolutely zero. The best thing like he's flashed on his entire profile uh, is the fact that he had a wide receiver four PFF receiver grade last year of 70.1. Like, but he still hasn't even gotten to like the wide receiver three range of a PFF receiver grade. He's never done anything in targets per route run. He's never done anything in yards per route run. So I'm just, I'm not really confident in Zay Jones. He had a nice little stretch run down, you know, at the end of the year last year. So, I mean, if you want to take him at the very end of a, you know, you're in a really deep draft, you want to throw a dart at him and maybe you release him once the season starts, I think it's fine. I just, I, I don't think the the chances of it are that great. Honestly, like Chenault is the one that has my attention the most, but he's buried right now. Like I, I think, you know, Chenault actually did flash a 71.8 PFF receiver grade as a rookie. That is good enough for a wide receiver three. Um, it puts him in bucket two, right, of the study that we talked about earlier that I did this offseason, you know, of looking at PFF rookie receiving grades. You look at his targets per route run, he's already had a wide receiver two season of 21%. So, like, if there's anybody on the team outside of Kirk um, that I would think, you know, just from a talent perspective, could end up still coming through, and I know it is our running joke, but it, you know, it would be <laughs> LaVisca Chenault. But now the list is even longer than anything we've ever thought of, of the things that have to go right for him to get on the field. So, Chenault is a guy that most likely what will happen, you know, if Zay Jones or Marvin Jones or somebody gets hurt or we get news in camp that he's actually moving up the depth chart, most most likely it's going to be an in-season injury. And so it's more like, okay, then I would pay attention to him on the waiver wire. I might throw a little bit of money at him because nobody else is interested um, and, and just see what happens. But yeah, it's none of these guys will I be forcing on the Jags receiving core. I thought with Zay Jones, you were going to say the only time he's flashed was when he like did that glitch in the matrix stand up where he fell down and then he just like somehow just like reversed his entire body motion. He did it twice actually like that in terms of raw athleticism. I don't know what the hell is going on with Zay Jones, but he's got it. And also uh, I remember this caught my attention, like in the preseason last year, uh, John Gruden was saying like they needed to find a role for Zay Jones because he was the most conditioned wide receiver on the team. So I thought that was a good point to bring up as well. And did they find a role before Henry Ruggs got out? Not really, but just thought I'd add that two cents to it. Tight end, the main event. Evan Ingram, Dan Arnold. Dwayne hates Evan Ingram personally. No, no, no he <laughs> Not doesn't. True. Not true. I lied. <laughs> But he would, take but, but I can't, but I can't blame it on the ADP because exactly. it's not high. <laughs> Here's my argument for Evan Ingram in 2017. He was fourth in PPR points per game among tight ends in 2018. He was seventh in 2019. He was seventh. He got injured in those years. Unfortunately, last two years, he was 18th and 22nd. So right now you can buy Evan Ingram in a new offense with Doug Peterson, who I'm not trying to say he enabled Kelsey and Ernst, but let's face it. He at least has experience in an offense that does target the tight end a lot. 
and now with Trevor Lawrence there instead of Daniel Jones and no Jason Garrett, you can wrap your mind around Jacksonville actually being a better situation for Evan Ingram. One year, fully guaranteed $9 million contract. I think Dwayne was right where I'm probably putting a little too much behind the one-year deal comparing him to guys that got multi-year contracts. But my God, man, like just Ingram, you can get him in the last two, three rounds of drafts. If you draft Trevor, Trevor Lawrence, you should absolutely be adding Ingram at the end because of how cheap he is. I'm just not scared of Dan Arnold, man. Like he came into an offense that had nobody. He had a couple games with five catches, but my God, 28 catches for 324 scoreless yards in like nine games. This is our king. It's not like the Jaguars went out of their way to trade for him. They traded CJ Henderson for a third round pick and Carolina was like, here's Dan Arnold as well. I mean, the dude's been on four teams since 2019. He's a converted wide receiver. Like I think Dan Arnold honestly could either be a backup receiver or just a pure number two tight end who comes in for a handful of snaps per game. No, Ingram is not my favorite late round tight end. Those are Irv Smith and Gerald Everett. There's no reason why any of you should be drafting Evan Ingram in your one tight end leagues. But man, like we were talking about in the best ball uh, stream, Dwayne, if Ingram gets that 80% route rate, which based on his salary, based on his competition, based on his profile as a proven first round pick, somewhat proven first round pick, I do think Ingram is worth that dart in best ball because he's going to be shooting up our weekly ranks the second he gets that full-time role, which I think is more likely than not to happen. Yeah, I mean, Ingram t- twice in his career when he's played at least 15 games, which has happened three times out of uh, his five seasons in the league. Um, so in 2020, he got to 86% of the routes. And in that year, he finished as the tight end 14. And then you had him as a rookie get to 77%, right? So almost to that mark. And we all know that was one of those historic, that was a historic rookie season. Um, where he was the tight end five with 174 fantasy points uh, PPR, which was 11.6 per game. So we know that, you know, he's capable. You know, I mentioned it yesterday, so I'm not going to be, you know, a dead horse. It's just all around the deteriorating uh, yards per route run, targets per route run, a lot of the things that we like to look at that say, hey, if this player did actually get into a new opportunity and they had more chance, what do we think they would do with it? And so the the one point that goes against Ingram is all of these things have been in a downward spiral since 2018. His yards per route run have gone from 1.83 to 1.59 to 1.28 to 0.89, and then his targets per route run, they've held a little steadier, but have gone from 22% to 20% to 15%. But to your point, do I think there's a chance Evan Ingram gets to 80% of the routes? Yes, I think it could happen. I do think Dan, Ar- Dan Arnold will be potentially enough of a pain in the butt like to keep him more like 65, 70, but he could get to 80. Um, and his targets per route run, could he get to 20? Well, he's been at 20 or better four seasons you know, out of five. So I, it's in the range of outcomes. I just wish that we didn't have you know this deteriorating profile. But again, like you mentioned, you can get him super late. So it's all it's all priced in, you know, with where you're getting him. So I I don't think any of the arguments, you know, that you're making um, are necessarily wrong. I just think that, you know, the ADP is fine. I'm not that excited about him. I don't know how good he is anymore. I don't really care about the contract. That doesn't do anything for me. But at the ADP, like, I'm fine. Here are guys I'm taking ahead of him because, my God, I do not want to be known as the Evan Ingram guy in the fan. <laughs> you don't want to be Evan Ingram truther? I'm, I'm going to make you into that no I'm matter what. I'm taking Gerald Everett, Robert Tunyon, David Njoku, Mike Jasicki, even Dwayne's boy, Albert O. Definitely ahead of Evan Ingram. And, yeah, Fryermuth, Knox, Higby, Irv Smith goes without saying. So my tight end 20. But when he's going tight end 24, 25, I still think Ingram, for you best ballers out there, that you want to have your three tight ends because, you know, maybe you whiffed on Gronk trying to wait at the position. You got to throw some darts. I think Ingram is your perfect guy to cap off that roster. So entirely... Uh, we'll, we'll try to hold off on any more Ingram talk uh, for the rest of the summer because I'm pretty sure everyone's already got their quota in. But, Dwayne, as always, let's quickly summarize kind of our overall thoughts on the Jaguars' offense. Trevor Lawrence, someone who is right there in the low-end QB2 pool. We fully understand there's a chance that this quote-unquote generational prospect puts things together better. He has a little rushing upside, and you sh- can and probably should prioritize him if you find yourself with Christian Kirk already on the roster. Just realize we need a lot of boxes to be 
checked, and he's not someone that we're going to be focusing, overly focusing on in traditional one quarterback redraft leagues. At running back, we want to stay ahead of consensus on Travis Etienne. We already are. He has like... I, He's honestly just a cheaper version of DeAndre Swift right now, and I think he arguably has the potential to have even more if James Robinson's recovery doesn't go well, which, brain, you know, flash, it's not looking great so far, and that's because we are, and that is why we are out on James Robinson. Christian Kirk, someone right there in the wide receiver four range, at the same time, just doesn't seem to have that best case scenario really worth chasing. I meant to read these off before, but PFF projections, which are live on the website under our projections tab, shocker, 110 targets for Kirk, 103 for Marvin Jones, 70 for Zay Jones, 46 for Chenault, 36 for our guy Laquan Trebo, who we forgot to mention until now. There is a chance that this offense just keeps a high-end receiver, a high-end tight end, a high-end running back involved in the passing game. And even if Kirk is the number one wide receiver in Jacksonville, could feasibly a number two, number three pass game option, not the sort of ceiling we want to chase. Point is doubly true for Marvin and Zay Jones, as well as our guy Visca. And finally, Evan Ingram. Really going out on a limb here. I think he should be your third tight end on best ball teams. Please don't call me the Evan Ingram guy, but you know what? He is undervalued right now, so don't be afraid to grab him at the end of the draft. Anything else I missed, Dwayne? No, I think just it's it's Travis Etienne season. Yeah. That's that's really the biggest takeaway here. Like he and Brees Hall are absolute priorities in the late third, early fourth round, especially if you only have one running back on your team at that point. So let's say you're drafting down in the 10 hole, 11 hole, and you want to start receiver, receiver. Like let's say you want to do that, that, that uh, start that we've talked about multiple times that hasn't worked out yet for me, but eventually it's going to end where you go <laughs> Stefan Diggs, you go CD Lamb. Man, I would be perfectly fine coming back and going Brees Hall and ETN right away because you're picking against guys like, you know, DK Metcalf, you know, Terry McLaurin. And we like McLaurin, not saying these things are bad, but you're getting into a range of receivers that have enough questions around them that, you know, taking the receivers with passing game upside and explosive playmaking ability, you know, uh, I think it makes sense, right? And then you don't have to worry about like the David Montgomery's and some of the other guys. And you've got two great wide receivers. You got a two, you got two good running backs with upside. At a minimum, grab one of them, right? You don't have to grab both of them if you don't want. Um, or say you start with one running back, one receiver, just coming back and grabbing one of those two guys at round three, four turn, like. I think just opens up your flexibility and you're keeping upside baked into your roster. Just all things that we really want to do to, to not just beat your league mates, but to destroy them. Like we want to, we want to take the, their will to survive their will to want to fate play fantasy football anymore. Like we want to take that from them. Like that's our goal ultimately <laughs> because we're good people. But when it comes to fantasy football, like we just, we want to dominate, right? We don't just want to win. Just win baby and dominate, just dominate baby. That should be the, uh, quote from the late great Al Davis you heard the man if you take one thing from this podcast draft Travis Etienne go dominate those fantasy football leagues we'll be back on Monday with the NFC South kicking things off with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as we continue to go through our divisions appreciate you guys always tuning in to PFF Fantasy Football Podcast for Dwayne I'm Ian until next time take care everybody